Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Welcome to uh, this further evidence session of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee as part of our inquiry into disinformation and fake news. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Dr Alexander Kogan to give evidence to the committee this morning. Um, whilst there is a, a wide range of topics that I'm sure will come up and this is a complex matter, I think there are um, two or three quite clear areas of interest to the committee which I'm sure will come out during questioning. Um, Firstly, I think with regards to what's, what's been called the Facebook data breach, for which you've, um, Dr. Kogan, been, been seen as a central player, is to understand more about that, and in particular Facebook's knowledge of the work that you were doing and the extent of that work, uh, to understand more about the use Cambridge Analytica made of that work that you did, and indeed your relationship with them. And I think thirdly, just to understand a little bit more about your work in general, uh, as, and uh, your, your academic research and your, the work you've done for other people. Um, if I could start, start us off, though, looking at this, um, this first area, um, trying to understand a bit more about um, the way in which you worked with Facebook data and, and indeed Facebook's knowledge of the work that you were doing. Um, I was very interested to read in the written statement that you've supplied with the committee, which uh, the committee has now published and is available online through the committee's website for anyone to, to read. Uh, but you said in your written statement, and I quote, that throughout 2013, Facebook provided me with several macro level, macro level data sets on friendship connections um, and emotion usage. Could you explain this a little bit more about that? This is in the period before you developed uh, the app that's at the centre of the, the Facebook, Facebook data breach. What, what sort of um, information did Facebook provide you with? Sure. So uh, we were collaborating with a team at Facebook. Uh, I believe they worked on protecting care. And uh, the data set we received initially was about every friendship made in the world uh, between every country over a number of years. And it was broken down by month. So um, it was how many friendships were created between the United States and the UK in March, say, 2011. How many friendships were made between the UK and Canada in April 2012 and things like that. So it's, when we say macro, we mean at the country level or in the aggregate. Um, later on, they provided me a data set uh, about emotional expression. I believe uh, these are the emojis that we often see, like the smiley face, the sad face, things like that. So this was also in the aggregate. It was a bit more segmented. Uh, what I mean by that, it was broken down by gender and age groups. So how many um, smiley faces were used by, say, men 20 to 30 years old, things like that. Um, but that was for a particular week, uh, I believe, in August 2013. Yeah. yeah. Ha, ha, from the information that was given to you by Facebook, is it, was it possible to, to break that down in any way? Could you extrapolate information about individuals? Was no. it purely, purely macro-level data? Exactly. Yeah. But um, the, what, and what was, the, was that data useful to you in, in the work you were doing? Did it help you... Uh, design other tools? Did it help you design apps that you went on to work on? Um, so it was useful from an academic perspective. So we were using it purely for the lab, and we're studying things like, can we predict how much money is donated during natural disasters uh, by different entities, by different countries, based on the number of friendships that exist between these two nations. But it was really this macro perspective. Um, and how did you... How did you become introduced to Facebook um, to the extent to which they were prepared to give you yeah. data like this to work with? Uh, so my mentor uh, and advisor from my undergrad days at UC Berkeley uh, was consulting for them. And he was working with their protecting care team to solve problems of people posting embarrassing photos and not taking them down. So he was helping them understand how can we better tackle that. Uh, and the focus was on emotions and speaking to people on an emotional level about, hey, this doesn't make me feel good, would you mind taking it down? Mm -hmm. And my understanding was this was really helpful to Facebook in terms of combating that issue. And who was, who was the personal people at Facebook you, you worked with at this time on this project? Yeah, so there are a couple of user experience researchers um, who were on the Protect and Care team. Are you able to say who they were? I can, but I prefer privately, just 
because they're not really central to uh, the story, um, and I want to protect their confidence. Okay, that's, that's understood. Perhaps we can follow up on that, yeah. that separately. Um, Facebook, when they gave evidence to us in February, said that they didn't give out any Facebook user data, but clearly they did, even if it was in a macro form. Uh, I think that's tricky in the sense that most data that we'll look at around the world in public data sets comes ultimately from the individual, like even the World Bank data or the health organization data, right? Ultimately, any economic activity is driven by, at least at the start, by people. Now, when you deliver it to somebody, you're going to give it at a country level or an organization level. And I think Facebook's thinking about it the same way, where we're giving you math, aggregated information, rather than that was generated from users. But there's, once you go up to that level, it's very difficult to go back down. But I suppose if you're giving people out if data out on a macro level, the purpose of doing that is to help you design tools to target Facebook users on an individual basis and understand how you might do that. Uh, not in this case. I think this was really an academic collaboration. The people I was working with, uh, uh, they were PhDs. And so they had a strong interest in research generally. And they were now working at Facebook as user experience researchers, but they maintained that academic passion. And so this was an ability for them to go and explore that academic passion. And that was really the focus. Uh, there was really no conversation at this point about any Facebook tools or anything like that. It was really one way for us to benefit and build uh, research. But all, all research has a purpose. Um, and as you said yourself earlier on, if if one of the things you were looking at was how could you encourage uh, people from one country to give money to support uh, disaster relief in another country, then that, that the, the methodology for doing that could be derived from the work you were doing looking at these interactions between Facebook users in different countries. I think it's quite downstream. Um, I mean, we're doing very early basic science, right? Before we get to application, there's a lot of steps there. I mean, in our case, we're looking at just associations. Uh, now, there's really interesting potential for impact. Uh, but that's quite downstream. It requires quite a bit of extra research. Um, and I don't know if Facebook would really be even the, the vehicle for achieving this. I think but, governments would be. But I think, you know, for downstream to exist, there has to be an upstream, doesn't it? It has to start somewhere. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, there, uh, and this would seem to be an area where it would start. But from what you said now and what you said in your statement, I think that Facebook has not been clear when they discuss the way in which data they hold is used by outside organizations. Because they sort, they, they sort of draw a very clear distinction in the evidence of the committee between Facebook user data that is accessed by developers through, through tools and apps that they create yeah. and interact with, and data that Facebook, Facebook holds. And, they've, and they said to the committee that they don't share data that they hold themselves on users. The only user data that is gathered by developers is done through tools that they've created. But I think it is not as clear as that at all, is it, from what you said? Yes. If, you're, if your basis is that aggregated data is derived from users and that, in your mind, would still count as user data, then I would agree with that statement. Yeah. And that Facebook clearly had a program of uh, working with academics and outside institutions in, in many ways to try and help them understand the aggregated data based on their users. I mean, I think the, I wouldn't go as far as ascribing that much intent as far as their desire. But I think it's well documented that Facebook collaborates with researchers. I mean, you could just go look at the, the public records of publications of Facebook researchers and academics working together in publications. Mm. And there's a number of them. But I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, that in some ways, you, people sought to portray you as some sort of rogue operator. But nevertheless, you're someone who, was, who before, before the development of the app, which we'll come on to talk about, yes, sir. were already working with Facebook, yes, on, using Facebook data that had been given to you by Facebook. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I think given some of the things that have been said about you, some people might find that quite surprising. And I certainly think based on the evidence we've received from Facebook uh, to the committee, I yes, think sir. that is surprising. Um, and the, with this particular pre-project that you were mm -hmm. working on, um, at the end of that project, was the, uh, was the data that had been used um, to run these... Uh, these tests and this analysis, was that, what, was, what happened to that at the end of the process? So uh, we were going to hold on to it indefinitely uh, because we were writing many papers. So uh, what, throughout that year, 2013 and into 2014, writing about 10 different publications on it, different ideas. Um, and so normally we would hold on to the data set to generate further uh, publications in the future. Um, 
once December 2015 comes along and Facebook reaches out, I, I, they ask me to delete everything, including this academic data set, which I did. Okay, so, so, there, so, when, so there was no requirement from Facebook um, when they gave you that data in the first place that you should destroy it or give it back? No. In fact, there was no even signed agreement initially. They gave me the data set without any agreement signed. It was just, here's an email, here's a data set. Uh, sometime later, maybe even as far as a year later, they came and we did actually have a signed agreement. Mm. Uh, but I think that was in the wake of, uh, if you recall, there was a pretty big scandal about Facebook's trying to make people sad publication. I think this was the fall of 2013. Mm. Uh, in the wake of that, they started to look more carefully at academic collaboration, so how do we formalize them a bit better. What was Facebook trying to achieve out of this, do you think? In terms of the... What, what was the value to Facebook of you doing this work? I think it makes their employees happy. I think my perception was that management tolerated this. It wasn't a focus because obviously it takes away time from their employees working on how to make Facebook a better plat platform. But this was something they would gave their employees uh, to stimulate them, to allow them to have this a relationship. Uh, okay, so, okay, so they're, they're saying to their employees, you can take macro level Facebook user data uh, and you can give it to academics who don't work for us without any kind of contract or license and let them play with it. Yes, sir. Um, and just see what happens. Yes, sir. And as simple as that. Simple as that. It seems pretty open, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the company is very open. Uh, Maybe too open. Yeah. Arguably so. <laughs> open not with their own information, but with their users' data. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and given the last month, uh, there's a lot of credibility to that statement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chris Matheson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Cogan, good morning. And, and I should just say, with the Chairman's permission, I might need, mean to leave a little bit before the end of your evidence session. No disrespect is, uh, is, is meant. Um, you developed, you, you're an academic psychologist. Yes, sir. But you also developed several apps um, yes, sir. that managed to harvest um, a large amount of data. Yes, sir. And that data then had a financial value of its own. Yes, sir. Which came first? the um, academic research or the idea that you might make a business out of this? Uh, certainly the academic research. And at what point did you suddenly think, oh, there's money to be made here? So um, if we step, take a step back, the app was initially created to help us with the relationship we have with Facebook on the publications. So we were writing, like I said, 10 papers. And um, I'm a psychologist, so we work at the individual level, typically, rather than this macro level that an economist or sociologist would be interested in. And so we created this app to add data to the papers we were writing. So initially it was, we create this app, we collect data at the individual level, and we would add it with the Facebook data that we just discussed. Can I, can I just check, yeah. which, which app are we talking about at this point? So this is the, the, the very app we've been dealing with yeah. throughout the story. And you, what, what's it called? It was called the CPW Lab app. Right. CPW was my lab's name, Cambridge for Sociality Wellbeing Lab. Um, so I registered it under my personal account in Facebook, as you would have to as a developer. Um, and it's very simple to me. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit of code, I get a login button, and then we would embed it in our studies that we're running as a lab to collect the Facebook data. So this was at some point in 2013. The conversation about a potential financial project came later once I was introduced to SCL. And this was spring 2014. So it was SCL that put the idea in your mind about um, maybe monetizing the, the app? I think that's fair. Um, it's slightly more nuanced in that the conversation with SEL initially was not at all about Facebook. Uh, when I first was introduced to them, um, they wanted just consulting services and survey design. Mm -hmm. And over our conversations of the next couple of months, talking about other projects and other data sets, there was this interest in the Facebook data that grew out. But you had on, a, on a, d a drive somewhere, a large bunch of data. Yes, sir, in my lab. Yeah. How, um, do, do you sell the data or do you sell it as part of a package with your skills? Oh, we never sell that data. So the data we collect as a lab uh, is never sold. So, I mean, that'd be a very so serious... Is it, so is it transferred to... No. So that'd be a very serious breach of ethics. Uh, we, number one, that data never left my servers. Uh, it was used exclusively with my PhD students. Uh, number two, when we collected that data, we collected it by telling our participants it was for academic research. So we had no right to use it for anything else. 
So you would sell the app and somebody else will collect data using the app? So uh, let me just return to that in a second. Um, Sorry. Yeah, and, and just so, so it's clear, I know this has been a point of confusion. And third, we didn't collect names when we did the academic work. So even if you know, we threw out the ethics and we threw out any concerns, uh, we didn't really even have the ability. So when we get to SCL, we collect new data and we use the app to collect new data and we store it in a different server and in a different location and under different terms of service. I think just to, for clarity here, yeah. where I think Chris was asking about the CPW app, yeah. uh, which you're saying that you held the data and that was never shared. Yeah. But obviously the, the, the My Digital Life app that we'll come on to talk about later on, yeah. that's, that, is, that is separate from this. So that is separate and it's actually not the app that was used for the project was SEL. Hmm. Uh, only a couple of hundred people ever used the This Is Your Digital Life app hmm. and that data was not given to SEL. Uh, the app is actually called the GSR app. So once we get to 2014, and we're going to do the project commercially, um, we change the name of the app to the GSR app, which changes description. Uh, Christopher Wiley provides us a, a commercial terms of service that we put on the Facebook platform. Um, and at that point, once we've made it commercial and separate from the university, we hook it up to a different data set, or a different database, different servers, and the data goes there. So it's never in the same place, uh, it can never be mixed up, um, and is, the new data is collected. Is the technical side of the app, yeah. the programming, is that the same? It's the same. Right, um, you said you, you, you were introduced to SCL. What of the um, aspects of this inquiry that we have um, uh, encountered is um, the interchangeability between SCL and Cambridge Analytica? So. Um, but you were clear you were working for SCL. Yeah, I never had a contract with Cambridge Analytica. Did you ever have any contact with them? Uh, that is tricky in the sense that the folks that are involved in one are very much involved in the other. So the folks that I interacted with, apologies. Um, Alexander Nix I worked with, I met a couple of times, he's obviously involved with both. Uh, the data science team is very similar on both sides. I think Alexander uh, Taylor is currently the head of research. I interacted with him. And now, I interacted with all of them in their capacity as SCL elections, um, but obviously they're now part of Cambridge Analytica, and so I'm not even entirely clear what is the distinction. And were you clear at the time when you were working with them? So the name Cambridge Analytica, when we started working with them, uh, I didn't hear, it didn't come up. I only probably heard about it January 2015, after we had already collected all of the data. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask you a question. Um, which is probably the, the specific answer, which probably commercially confidential, but it will give us a ballpark. Yeah, of course. Um, when you're selling um, an app and, yeah. um, to to, to um, a company such as SCL, roughly how much? Uh, w w if I was to do the same thing at the same time, roughly how much might I be negotiating for? Which I I'm sure you don't want to give away. Oh no, I, I could be fully transparent with this. So um, to provide you a bit of context, that. The app itself is not very uh, expensive because you could write this app in three or four days. It's not technically challenging in any way. Facebook explains to you how to do it. So and there's great documentation on this. So it's the app itself, don't think of this as something that's valuable. What is valuable is the data that comes in. And so for the project that we did, the goal was to recruit about 200,000 people to authorize the app. To recruit that many people, there are various ways. Um, there's been some confusion about this. Some folks believe it was a honeypot, so to speak, where we made a viral quiz, put it on Facebook, people click, click this. That's not actually not the case. Uh, those things are hard to do um, and wasn't our avenue. Instead, what we did was we went um, and we did basically a market research project where we asked a company that specializes in recruiting people to recruit 200,000 people for us to do a survey about personality and various other items. And as part of the survey, there was this login button that they clicked and that authorized that, the data. So the money here, the expensive bit, is paying those users because each person is cost about three to four dollars. So obviously we're recruiting about 200,000 people, so we're in that six to eight hundred thousand dollar range just to pay the users. And that was indeed what came, or SEL in this case, uh, paid for during that first step of the project. Later on, 
they came to us and they wanted to get predictions. And so the predictions, now we use the data to drive predictions about people's personalities. And so for that, they paid us 230,000 pounds. And I think that mm -hmm. I testify to that in the written statement. Yeah, and that goes to you, your company, or the university? The company. Right. Um, did you have any day-to-day -day operational contact um, with them once you'd handed over the, the app? Mm -hmm. So uh, we ran the app. All right. So what, the, the way the project ran is they would give me the survey questions, mm -hmm. and I would be in charge of running the survey and collecting the data. Um, so this arrangement makes sense because this way I, I control the data, I receive the data, I have the data, and I can do the models on it and then deliver them um, what we were contractually obligated to do. And ju just to be clear, unlike the academic data, this had names and all other yes, identified. Sir. Can I ask just one more question? You, just to take you back to the introduction with SCL. Yes, sir. Um, you suggested that Chris Wiley had given you the um, terms of service. Yes, sir. Is that, and is that correct? You, did you deal directly with Mr. Wiley on yes, that? Yes, sir. Were there any lawyers involved? Did you have a lawyer? Or did uh, you? I did not. Chris Wiley said he was a data expert, in, a, a law expert in data law. And so he guided us and provided, and, and this is well documented, we can provide the committee mm -hmm. evidence of this. Um, okay, thank you. Indicus. When Facebook gave you information, could you identify individuals from that information? Do you mean the data set they gave yes. during the research project? Yes. No. Was there other data where you could identify individuals given to you by Facebook? Not through the API, I mean directly by the company. Is that correct? Not, not directly? Uh, you mean not through the API, not through the app, but directly by the company? Yes. No. So at no stage did Facebook give you information that could identify individuals? No. Okay. I want to ask you about your relationship with Cambridge University. Yes, sir. And I note that you started, you're, you're a uh, research associate and university lecturer at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Psychology. Yes, sir. And you're appointed that in 2012? August 2012. <coughs> are, are you, uh, are you, do you receive a salary in that post? I do. And did you apply for the job? I did. Are you associated with an individual college? Yes, I am. Which college? Mordlin College. And do you teach individual students in tutorials and, I do. and so on? We've been talking also about the various uh, companies that you have set up. Yes, sir. There's a number of different companies. Uh, there's two. Two. Yes, sir. What are the names of those companies? So there's Global Science Research, which is a UK entity, and then there was Philometrics, which was a US entity. Right. And when did you uh, send up, set up GSR? GSR was set up sometime in the spring of 2014. 2014? Yes, sir. And what about Philometrics? Philometrics, I believe, we set up in the summer of 2015. And does the intellectual property relate to those businesses um, belong to you, the companies, or the university? Uh, they belong to me, sir. They belong to you as an individual? Uh, well, they belong to the company. But uh, when I set up the company, uh, there was n the university makes no claim on the intellectual property that's brought over. Uh, my understanding in talking to the university is since the only thing here that's valuable is code or know-how. The university makes no claim on those things, uh, and it encourages its faculty members to indeed start companies to commercialize their work. On the Cambridge University website, you're listed both as Alexander Kogan yes, sir. and Alexander Spector. Yes, sir. Can you explain that? Yes, sir. Um, in 2015, I was married, uh, and my wife and I decided that it didn't make sense for me to take her name, for her to take my name. So we said, let's choose a new last name. Um, and since we're both religious and scientists, we thought the idea of light made a lot of sense. So we're looking for something related to light. Uh, then my father was sadly sick at the time, uh, and one of his surgeons was named Jason Spector. And we thought, that's a really cool sounding name. And it also nails down the theme of light because of spectrum. 
And so we decided on specter as a derivative spectrum, as a symbol of us going forward as a family. You know that Spectre is the evil organization in the Bond film. <laughs> it's an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> did you know that at the time? I did not. So you're not a James Bond fan? Okay. He's a Spectre fan. Exactly. So just, just going back to the, um, the app that you mentioned earlier, and we were talking about individual data from Facebook. Can you identify individuals through the API? Yes, sir. I mean, that's when you collect data through the API, a user authorizes the app. And so you can easily identify that user. And then depending on what other data you gather, you could also identify their friends. You can identify the friends? Yes, sir. As well as the people you consented? Correct. Has that always been the case? Yes, sir. Did that change in 2014 at all with the terms of service from Facebook? Yeah, so what changed was it was hard to not gather friends data. In terms of the user, you could still always identify them. Um, so on Facebook, your name, location, gender, and birth date are considered your public profile that anybody could search for. So if, you know, I don't have Facebook anymore, but if I had Facebook right now, I could go and search uh, Facebook and then I could look at your profile, and I would probably be able to see your name and some of this other information, even if we're not friends. I think what's difficult for pe people, well, for me to understand, and I think other people too, is the distinction that you're drawing between knowledge about individuals that's given to you by Facebook and knowledge that you derive through the API. Yeah. Can, you, can you expand yeah. on that? So, so what's the difference? So the difference is the... We, when you work with Facebook directly and the data sets we got, right, it, we took, they took millions of people and they averaged them together. And so you lose the individuality. You lose the differences. You just have a summary. And that's what we're working with. From a summary, you can't go back. So if we took the room here, for example, and we averaged everybody's age together, and let's just say it was 45. Yeah. Now, taking that number of 45, I cannot know your age because you're just part of that uh, group. So, and that's the problem, right? The, there's no way to go back once you summarize. And Facebook gave me summary. The API, you're getting your information, so I know exactly how old you are if you've given me your birthday. So, so essentially, you're deriving the same information. You're deriving personal information through the API. Well, the, the API gives you the personal information. That is correct. It's, uh, you never get personal information from the, the data that Facebook gave me throughout Academic Link. So from my personal perspective, yes, as, as an individual who's on Facebook, what is really the difference between personal information being handed over by Facebook and you deriving that information from the API? Uh, they're just not giving you, uh, us your personal information. They never say, uh, you know, Ian Lucas, 40 years old, right? I never get that. I get England, average age is 42, right? So at that point, um, I mean, there's just no real case for this is personal information because there's no people. It's a summary, it's a country at this point. Whereas obviously me getting information about you and I have no record in my database that says Ian Lucas, 42, is a very different case. All right. Thank you. So just a couple of questions about um, your work, well, the work at Cambridge University yes, on, this sort of, um, on this sort of analysis. There have been other tools that have been created at the university which help analyse people's Facebook likes and preferences yes, to determine the information about their, their data. I believe CubeU was, was one of those. Yes, sir. Uh, apps. Could you tell us, do you know much about the work of CubeU? Uh, Were you involved with that at all? I wasn't involved with CubeU. I know some about the collaborator they've worked with, which is the Psychometric Centre. And um, the, on the website of the Psychometrics Center, uh, there's also another API called Apple Magic Source. Yes, sir. Um, do you know who owns the license for Apple Magic Source? I would believe the Psychometrics Center. Itself, okay. Itself. And do you know who? Um, what, what, do you know who owns the underlying data? Would that be owned by the Psychometrics Center as well? Uh, so the My Personality dataset, I believe, was collected by uh, David Sowell, and before he joined the university. So I believe he would himself own the underlying dataset. 
Uh, now the tools, I believe, were built during his time in the university as part of the psychometric center. So I believe the center would, in theory, well, actually, let me back up, because my understanding of the university's position is the person that writes the code uh, often owns it, unless it's contractually stated that they don't. So I, I don't know who wrote that code and what contractual obligations and statements they have. Uh, so it's possible they had a developer that did assign it to the, the university and the psychometric center, or it's possible uh, they still own it, in theory, the code itself. And um, with a project like that, who would, who would benefit, just the developer um, himself, or would it be more widely available to researchers at the university? Uh, so the Psychometric Center is a bit of an unusual entity in the university in that it's involved in both the research and uh, commercial activities um, under the same umbrella. And this, it, it's more rare. So I split mine up where I had my university position, which was very separate from my company activity. This was a bit more under the same umbrella. So my understanding is the Psychometric Center uh, uses this data for both academic work and commercial work, and also just for fun for people to get results about what their page likes say. So, could there be a could there was there a commercial application? Do you believe from APIs like Happy Magic Source? I believe they certainly try to find a uh, commercial application. Um, I am aware they were talking to many commercial entities. I just don't know where those conversations went. Okay, and so what what what, what sort of what sort of commercial application would that have been? Would that have been using the data that they gathered uh, as a predictive model for targeting Facebook users? Uh, I don't know if it's quite that specific. Uh, I think my understanding of the way they envisioned it is a company would bring in its own Facebook data uh, with their page likes, pass it through this Apply Magic Sauce API, get back predictions about various psychological traits that then this company can use for whatever purpose they want, such as micro-targeting or whatever yeah. else. Okay, thank you. Brendan O'Hara. Um, Dr. Cogan, could you tell me, or tell the committee, under what circumstances did you first meet SCL? Yes, so I was introduced to SCL by a PhD student at Cambridge. Um, I knew this student because I had given him stats advice, statistics advice, on his PhD from time to time. And, and what was the purpose of, of the meeting? So um, my understanding was that the student was part-time consulting for SEL elections, um, and he had a friend there named Chris Wiley, who he thought would be great for me to meet uh, and see where the conversations go. And when was that meeting? I believe it was January or February 2014. So you met, you met with Cambridge, you met with SEL in January, February 2014. Correct, sir. And that meeting was initiated by someone working for SEL. Correct, sir. And what was the outcome of that meeting? So I think uh, my recollection is right. We uh, talked about potentially collaborating on uh, me providing them some consulting services. And we also talked about them providing me with some of the commercial data sets they had acquired so I could set up a big data science institute. What was your decision to set up GSR directly related to your meeting with SCL? Uh, so GSR was set up entirely to do the project with SCL. Uh, I actually, in fact, relied on the guidance on how to do it appropriately. Uh, the, but this came a little bit later. I mean, we, at this point, we're not talking about any commercial entities. Um, even the Facebook project is still a little bit off from coming out. Yeah, just, so just for the record, you, you, you met with uh, SCL in the January of 2014, and you set up GSR in the May of 2014, yes, specifically to work for SCL. Correct, sir. Okay. And the, the June of 2014, uh, the, the, one of the directors of, the director of analytics at SCL wrote to Cambridge University to say that Dr. Cogan first introduced us to the possibility of using online social media data to score and predict human personality traits at a meeting in London, as we've said, in January 2014. Upon agreeing to explore the viability of this idea, Dr. Cogan then introduced us to Dr. David Stilwell at a meeting in Cambridge in February to discuss my personality project and whether it could be used in partnership with SCL. Why would the director of analytics SCL write to Cambridge University? Sure. So um, initially, when the project was envisioned, there was going to be a collaboration between myself and the psychometric center. And the idea was that since the Psychometric Center had already set up an API and models for personality, we would just use that to generate the predictions. And my side would be I would use my app that I had built to collect the data. The, so at some point during these negotiations, 
SEL floated a, a rough bu budget of about $2 million. So uh, I think this is something Chris Wiley mentioned during the conversation. So I'm like, all right, well, maybe we'll give the Psychometric Center half a million dollars to, for the modeling aspect of this. And so, as I just mentioned, I was trying to set up a big data science institute. That was my intention. And so there was a little money, I think a couple of hundred thousand dollars allocated for server costs and running that. As the conversations, and so uh, Psychometric Center was fine with that. They liked the idea. So as the conversations continued, uh, SEL backed off that. They really clawed. Um, and they said, well, we're not going to pay for anything other than the data collection at this point. This is the 800000 to pay the participants to answer their survey. And, and they said, well, we don't see why we should be paying half a million dollars for the models the Psychometric Center is providing. At this point, I, well, I went to the Psychometric Center and said, like, look, they're not willing to pay it. Um, how about $100,000? I was trying to broker a middle road. Uh, they refused. Psychometric Center refused. Um, and so SEL instructed me to remove them from the project. At this point, um, Dr. Stilwell and Dr. Kaczynski, who are the two people I was talking to at the Psychometric Center about this, they went and informed Professor Rust of the situation, because he had never been involved in this. And Professor Rust wrote a complaint a letter to the university saying that I think Alex is trying to swindle us out of this. He's going to get a million dollars. We're promised 500,000. Now there's going to be 100,000. Um, and so he made some serious accusations. Um, SEL wrote a letter to the university in my defense to state, well, this is just not true. Um, and the committee has already seen the contract it ultimately signed with SEL. So you also know this is not true. That okay, so, so the, the timeline was you met, Cambridge, you met SEL in the January of 14. You then engaged them, or they engaged Cambridge University in the February of 14. Then Cambridge University decided not to go ahead with it for whatever reason, then you set up two months later That's ESR. Not quite right. So the, the problem uh, with that account is, it's not Cambridge University, it's this one lab in the university, Psychometric Center. Well, the, but the, the, the director of analytics, SCL, in his email, wrote to Cambridge University. I'm just trying to, oh, yeah. trying to work out who he spoke to and why he spoke to Cambridge University okay. and then nothing to come of it and then for you to set up within weeks GSR. Yeah. So the plan was already to set up GSR. That was not something new. The intention throughout this process was I would be setting GSR because there was going to be this collaboration between GSR, a private entity that I held, in the Psychometric Center, which is a lab in the university, which, as I've said, is a bit unusual in that they work both on the commercial and academic space. So we're going to collaborate. So the breakdown occurred because the Psychometric Center refused to move from this price tag of half a million dollars. And so SEL kicked them off the project. At that point, Psychometric Center makes a complaint to the university, to their legal team, that, hey, we think this is inappropriate. We were promised half a million dollars. So SCL writes to the university legal team to explain that what the Psychometric Center is alleging is untrue. But that, that's not quite the account in this email, that because, as I say, the, the then director of, of SCL mm -hmm. in, in the February wanted to discuss the My Personality Project yes. and whether it could be used in partnership with SCL, yes, sir. having already looking at, um, you know, online social media data to score and predict human personality traits. So I, I'm just struggling to see how you, you, one went from this meeting, this, what you described as a fairly informal meeting with an associate of yeah. SCL in the January to all the way through February, this great plan that never came to fruition, then you setting up GSR yes, and working with... Sure. So let me we'll walk through that in a bit more, a bit more detail. So I meet uh, SEL, I meet Chris Wiley in particular, and we start these conversations. And um, they're trying to collect many data sets, right? They're buying up many data sets from data brokers, at least that's what I'm led to believe. And so I say, well, listen, if you're interested in data sets, and I know you're interested in personality, and the interest in personality was already there, uh, let me introduce you to the Psychometric Center, who holds a very big data set on personality. So this is the My Personality Project. So I facilitate a meeting for them to start that conversation. SCL is at this point interested in acquiring this entire data set. 
So they're interested in acquiring this data set, but David Stowell, who owns the data set, that's what we've already discussed, um, decides not to sell it to them. And the grounds were that he collected that data by telling people it was going to be for academic work, and so he felt it would be inappropriate to sell it. All fine, so far. At this point, myself, David, and Michal Kaczynski, who was also part of the Psychometric Center, propose an alternative plan, where ra rather than using the data set they already have, we would use just the models they had built to make predictions, but we still need data to feed through these models. So I would collect the data through GSR, so that was always the plan, to and feed it through these models that the Psychometric Center owned, which is the applied magic sauce, and generate these predictions about personality. The bit that never came to fruition was this passing the data through their models, because, like I said, they won half a million dollars. So the only thing that changed was then GSR was not only responsible for the data collection, we're also responsible for the modeling aspect as well and the predictions. Okay, so you then set up GSR on your own? Uh, with one of my associates. Okay, so there's two of you, you're the two company directors yes, sir. of GSR. Yes, sir. And you have this relationship with SCL. Did the SCL pay you for your services? So at this point, they only paid for the data collection. Later on, in January 2015, when we delivered them sort of the second tranche of data, they paid uh, GSR 230,000 pounds. And how much did they pay initially before the payment of 230,000 yeah. pounds in January 15? Yes, how much were you paid by SCL or any of their associates? Uh, in terms of me, myself, or like uh, my company? The company. Uh, so we netted zero. The, the money that went through, the 800,000 I think you're referring to, is the cost for the participants. And this is actually paid almost entirely directly to Qualtrics. That money didn't even pass through us. So we would get an invoice from Qualtrics, we would give it to SEL, and SEL would pay that invoice directly. I, SEL, I think, gave us maybe 10, 20,000 pounds, if I recall correctly, to pay for the servers that we were running on Amazon Web Services. Uh, but all that money was entirely for that, and we had to match uh, anything we spent with an invoice. Um, so the company at that point was not paying any money at all. So, so the, the only money that you made as a company came in 2015. Correct, sir. And that was a £230,000 payment from, yes, sir. from SCL. Correct. Did you have an, uh, was your contract exclusive to SCL or, or could you approach or were you approached by any other data analytic companies? So it was not exclusive. So the way that my contract was set up was I owned the data set we collected and we were approached by a company called Genoia uh, again in summer 2014. And this was a company Chris Wiley set up yep. and immediately after leaving um, SEL. So, so when you were approached by Christopher Wiley, did you work with Christopher Wiley? Did you sell Christopher Wiley or Genoia? Did you sell them any of the, your data? We did, but it was not for a monetary exchange. So the agreement there was they would, we would give them our data set in exchange for the data sets he purported to have. Uh, he did not honor that agreement. He never delivered his data sets. And so we moved to cancel that contract um, by a legal letter in, I believe, March or February of 2015. Uh, okay, just to, to bring this to an end, Christopher Wiley maintained that he refused to work with you when he realized you were not setting up an academic institute as he believed you originally claimed, but you were setting up this private company with Alexander Nix. Uh, how, how do you respond to that claim? Uh, that's a fabrication. In what way? In, in all ways. I mean, Chris Wiley uh, helped me set up the for-profit entity. It was literally him who told me, please set up a for-profit entity. And then after he left SEL, he tried to get me to work with his company. I was not interested after I had kind of witnessed how he interacted with SEL. Um, and then he still wanted to have a partnership, so we agreed to do a fair commercial agreement. And so I gave him the data set, his company, his data set. Um, the only time this broke down was when he didn't honor his side of the agreement and didn't deliver the data. And we moved to cancel it in, I guess, yeah, fe uh, February and March 2015. Up to that point, uh, I would say Mr. Wiley was highly enthusiastic about working with me uh, and my commercial entity. Okay. Well, what was your personal relationship with SCL? 
And were you paid personally? I was like SCL ever, never, or any of their associates, never. I don't. Okay. And what is the status of uh, GSR now? Uh, it's been closed. And why was that? When, when was it closed and why? Uh, so I believe it was closed maybe a year ago. I'd have to double check the date for you. Um, it was closed because we were never able to. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's possible to get a bit more water. I think that this one's out. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, there you go. Okay, okay. PhD does the teach you how to open this. <laughs> um, from, 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 my, from my reading, the, the company was dissolved in October of 2017. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, why, why was it dissolved? So, um, we try to make... So, initially, when I set up the company, um, I wasn't really thinking about making a company. Um, we, I was really actually interested in setting up a non-profit uh, big data institute. And we I wanted to call it Mutual Science. Um, Mr. Wiley advised me, oh, you should also set up a for-profit entity. I think the reason was there'd be tax benefits, and that was um, global science research. Um, so the initial plan was we collect the data, um, I fulfill my obligations to SEL, uh, and then I would go and use data for research. As, after the project, we decided, well, maybe we could give this whole company thing a go. And so another fr associate joined the company, we actually had some business experience, because I had none, uh, to try to make a company of it. So we tried to develop a couple of products. Um, one was this brand report, but it just was never successful. We, so the 230,000 pounds that SEL eventually paid us, we used to invest into trying to build this product. We bought some Twitter data, we hired some developers. Um, we tried to sell it, but it was just not, we never got a single client. Uh, and so the money ran out, um, and so we closed the company just because it failed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Why was G GSR registered at the 29 Harley Street address? 29 Harley Street. Is that in Cambridge? I think it's in London. Do you know what the registered office of GSR was? So initially it was just my apartment uh, in Cambridge. I think later we moved it to... Um, an G innovation centre in Cambridge, and then later Manchester. Um, I'm actually surprised. Right. I'm generally surprised by this. So did someone, did you use an agent to set it up? Do we use an agent? We, 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 oh, we use Formation's house. Um, so so, they so who's, of, who's we? So myself and my associate who initially uh, that I meet the company with. Who is that? Uh, I want to keep the name private, just again, in confidence. Are they on the company's register? They are. Was that Joseph Chancellor? It was. So... You don't know anything about the Harley Street address? I'm legitimately surprised by that. Yeah, it's because it's used by uh, a lot of companies, shell companies, some of which have been used for money laundering for Russian oligarchs. Did you know that? I did not. I'm unfortunately not a Russian oligarch. Have you met any Russian oligarchs? I have not. Did SCL ever tell you that they would be using the information that, uh, that, that they were receiving in connection with, with, with these projects for political campaigning? Uh, so the, the official name of the company was SCL Elections, so it would be hard to miss that. So you knew it was going to be used for political campaigning? Yes, sir. Did, did they specify uh, where it was going to be used for political campaigning? Which so, countries? I Sorry. It's okay. What is that? It's the start of business. Oh. And when it's really exciting, it's a vote, but it's not a vote at the moment. Okay. It's okay. just the start of business. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was going to be in the United States, given that we were collecting data for the United States. Did you, was there any discussion about political campaigning in the UK? Uh, later. So after we had done this project, there was some discussion about it. Um, but it never went anywhere. Was that discussion with Alexander Nix at any time? Yes, it was. So Alexander Nix talked to you about political campaigning in the UK? He did. Thank you very much. Um, Joseph Chancellor, uh, his name has now come up. Um, can you explain his role as a, as a director in, in GSR? Was he your partner? Did you yeah. work on everything together? Uh, we did. Uh, so um, the, when the company was set up, we were 50-50 partners. Eventually we got another co-founder who came in, so we became equal third partners. Um, 
Yes. And so, so the work you were doing for SCL, uh, the work you're doing looking at Facebook data, he was your partner across all of that? Yes, sir. He's worked for Facebook since November 2015, hasn't he? Yes, he has. So when um, Facebook's um, response to from their Deputy General Counsel describing your, your work as a, a scam and a fraud, data harvesting, and they singled you out to say that um, you'd lied to us and violated our platform policies, yes. that, that, those remarks must apply to uh, Joseph Chancellor as well. Uh, I think in the, if you want to push on the spirit, I would agree. Um, I'm personally very glad they have not moved on Joe. Um, I think it'd be petty, personally. But, but um, you say you work on it together, so if it applies to you, it applies to him the same way. I think that'd be a fair characterization. But he, so do you not think it's odd that they, um, that they employ someone that they regard as a scam and a fraud and who's lied to them and violated their platform policies? <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't think it's odd. Well, I think, most, I, think, I think any normal person would think it's odd. It may not be odd in, in Facebook land, but... Uh. Uh, the reason I don't <laughs> think it's odd is because, um, in my view, Facebook's comments are PR crisis mode, yeah. right? I mean, I think... Uh, I don't believe they actually think these things because I think they realize that their platform has been mined left and right by thousands of others. And I was just the unlucky person that ended up somehow linked to the Trump campaign, and we are where we are. Um, I think they realize all this, and, but PR is PR, and they're trying to manage the crisis, and mm -hmm. it's convenient to uh, point the finger at a single entity and try to paint the picture this is a rogue agent. But do you, do you think it's surprising then that, the, that Facebook um, employs someone who knew all about this, all the, all the work that's being done, that this data, Facebook data, was being gathered to be used by SEL in elections in America, and yet you know, did very little to investigate that, even after the, um, this story was made public by the Guardian yes, newspaper at the end of 2015, when uh, Joseph Chancellor was already working for the company. Yes, sir. So I, I think, to, in fairness to Facebook, uh, my perception is they did a pretty thorough job of investigating the issue. They talked to all the parties involved, uh, they demanded that all the data be deleted. Um, the difficulty here is compliance. So um, I've seen Facebook has been challenged this idea of why didn't you audit anyone? The problem with an audit is the only thing you're going to catch are people who are trying to do the right thing but missed a few files. Because that's possible, right? You're trying to delete everything but maybe you missed a file here and there because you don't have forensic resources. What an audit cannot do is catch people who are trying to be bad actors because you could always put the data on a hard drive and stick it under your mattress. And so, in many ways, that's a futile effort. Um, you get, once the data's off the system, you really are on the honor system in terms of ever trying to put that genie back in the bottle. And would you agree with, um, I mean, Sandy Parakelis gave evidence to the committee a few weeks ago, yes, and he basically said that you can never really, once the data's gone, it's gone. You know, yes, and, and that you could, even if the, data, even if the original data set is destroyed, the, the derived value of the data could never be recovered because it, it, it then exists in a new form. Would you, would you agree with that? Uh, so, um, if you, so Facebook asked everybody to delete the data and its derivatives. So I think if you are careful in scope and really make sure anything that could be considered a derivative is deleted, uh, you could delete that. The problem is you're still on the honor system because if somebody decides not to, and it, I think in this case, I think that there's evidence now to suggest that somebody decided not to be honorable in terms of all the parties involved and didn't delete the data. It's very hard to ever know that until there's a PR crisis or somebody sees it and they get a tip. Yeah. But certainly the, um, the data that you acquired was used during the Ted Cruz campaign, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. I still admitted that as yeah. much to me. Do you, do you believe that the derived data was also used in the Trump campaign in part as well? I can't know. But you, you think it'd be likely? I would actually think it'd be unlikely, personally. Um, well, given that they, they, they've already said that they used um, data from the Cruz campaign and the Trump campaign. So the, the reason I think it's unlikely is uh, my understanding from talking to others who knew a bit more, because I wasn't involved by this point. This is much after my time. But my understanding is the Ted Cruz campaign was quite unhappy with the product that, they, uh, that SEL delivered to them. Um, and so, and also, the. SEL at this point is under enormous pressure from Facebook to clean up their act and delete all the data. Uh, if I'm a company, 
I don't know that I would risk the legal liability of somebody like Facebook suing me to keep a data set that has apparently failed with the last client that it was used for. Um, I don't know that this was their thinking, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to me that they would keep this around. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a couple more questions on yeah. this before bringing other colleagues? Um, the political work that SCL was engaged in, which you were supporting, this included the work for Ambassador Bolton's super PAC, didn't it? That I don't know. Um, because there are, there is emails that we published, um, yes, given to us by Chris Wiley, where, which reference you um, doing, working on gathering the yes, data um, for that work. Yes, sir. Um, so you were gathering data on state-specific work for uh, voters in Arkansas, North Carolina, and New Hampshire uh, to support Ambassador Bolton's political activities in those states? So the, the, details, the, the campaigns he was yeah, supporting. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that the details of who the candidates were was obfuscated for me. I mean, what I was told was we need these 11 states, and I was given the surveys that they wanted to ask in the collection. Uh, in terms of the details of who they're working with, uh, that was not really ever told to me. So Ambassador Bolton is a name I've recently heard. It wasn't the name that I can ever recall hearing at that time. Because um, uh, in this email it says that uh, the, the, um, this email was sent um, by, someone, by someone of the SELT yes, uh, saying, I also recall your very good idea that Kogan could model two-thirds of what he had of the last round of Bolton issues testing, thereby enabling faster, further modeling of the data team to be done first on that sample, yes, sir. then the model once all data was received. Uh, Kogan gets data daily, so two-thirds of the data must already be available, mm -hmm. even with the delay due to Qualtrics mistake. Um, was this done? Can the, can, can the preliminary findings be shared? So this sounds like a fairly dynamic process that you're, you're working on. It's feeding directly into the work for the Bolton um, Super PAC. It's less dynamic than it sounds, because what, the way the project ran is we did a few waves of data collection. And for each wave of data collection, SCL would provide me, this is the survey we want to ask. Uh, I wasn't instructed about why it's being asked, just this is the survey we want to ask. Then we would run the study, collect the data, and then we would apply the models we were building to generate predictions about each of these questions. The modeling process doesn't really even require us to know what the question is. It's just a number. We're just predicting that. So, But, but you being told, so, so when you described earlier on the yeah. surveys being set up, you've got a company going out, yes, sir. getting people, getting the, the, the bulk audience you need. That may sound like, to some people, when they heard you talk about it earlier, that may sound like a reasonably indiscriminate <coughs> process. But this would suggest that people are being deliberately targeted in certain states because that's useful to the commercial project that SCL are working on. So you directing the surveys team to saying we need more people from New Hampshire to respond to the survey to, to add into the model? Um, so it wasn't quite that. We actually did collect data from all 50 states. Uh, it was closer to the indiscriminate um, because the goal was to make predictions about as many people as we could. And in this case, for those 11 states, I think we delivered a couple of million people, two or three. Um, but the thesis was rather than necessarily just focusing on those states, it's better to go on all states to get the data faster because if Let's imagine you live in Virginia, you might have friends in West Virginia, and so we could collect that as well. So we collect the data actually across America. Um, I don't recall we ever actually, when we instructed Qualtrics to collect the data, there was any restrictions. You can, you can take a moment to read the notes if that would be helpful. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, just to make something also clear, the, the emails that you're talking about, I was never involved with. So I, I saw those emails actually for the first time yesterday when it was pointed out that this information has been submitted. Yeah, but you're clearly um, interacting with the people that are in the email chain because uh, you're working for them. Yeah, yeah, so I'm interacting with certainly the SEL team. Yeah. So it's, if you can imagine SEL's in between here, and I guess the Bolton Super PAC is on one side, they're instructing them, SEL's instructing me, but there's no communication between these two entities. And quite honestly, not, not even an awareness of this side. Yeah, but the, the, I mean, from, from our point of view, that, that doesn't really matter to us, yeah, where, sure, um, because you know, whether you had direct in, sure, in, in sure. face with the Bolton team, because uh, this is clearly a project that SCL are undertaking on his behalf, and you, sure. you are playing, you're clearly, clearly playing a vital role, because yeah. you, are, you are gathering data that's being inputted uh, yes, into, this, into the tools that are used to, yes, to support sir. that campaign. Yeah. Um, and, and so presumably you, were, you must have known or been told that there was a priority around processing data linked to certain states because 
the Bolton Super PAC project was focused at that time on specific races in, in specific dates, not looking states, not looking to build up a, a survey of the whole country, not at that point. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so what we're told is we're focusing on specific states, uh, but why we're focusing on those specific states, I have no recollection of ever being informed of. But you, as you said earlier, you, you knew it was elections. It was elections. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's elections in, I believe, the 9 or 11 states that we were contractually obligated uh, yeah. to seek out. Yes. Okay. But you didn't necessarily know who the candidates were, you just knew that the state, they, yeah. those were the state races exactly. you were working on. Exactly. Okay. Just finally, um, I just wanted to just cover off um, some of, just find some of finding on Alexander Nix and the evidence he gave to the committee. Um, can I just read to you some questions that I asked Alexander Nix and the answers he gave? And could sure. you tell me whether you think you agree with the answers that he yeah. gave? So I said to him, does any of your data come from global science research? And he said, no. That's a fabrication. Okay. Um, so I said... Maybe not now, but... They have not supplied you with data or information. He said, no. Total fabrication. Your data sets are not based with information you have received from them. Could be true, depending on what the data sets are now. Okay. But previous data sets would have been. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, yeah. We certainly gave them data. I mean, that's yeah. indisputable. So as far as you're concerned, he, he lied. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Paul Farrell. Uh, thanks, John. I have a, a, a few uh, different questions, but I just wanted to um, just close off some of the, the issues yeah, that have just been, be, yes, be, been raised. If you were doing this, this work, um, uh, why would you not want to know, uh, particularly at elections, who the ultimate client was? It's a good question. Um, I knew it was for Republicans, so I think that's true. But honestly, I wouldn't be able to recognize the names. I mean, I, I don't know the specific candidates in most primaries or elections in the United States. Um, it's just not something, that level of granularity is not something I've ever been interested in. So you didn't in. care, really? Uh, in terms of like the specific uh, candidates, no. I mean, that's uh, there are like, some there are some nice politicians around, some really nasty politicians around. So uh, why why wouldn't you care about whether the yeah, politician the is nice or not? Yeah. Uh, sir, my personal position on life is unless I have a lot of evidence, I don't know. Is the answer? Uh, it's a good lesson I've learned from science, where typically we just don't know. So in terms of politics, in particular. I rarely have a very strong opinion about a candidate, uh, whether they're nice or not. My general perception, though, is, especially in the United States, most folks are trying to do what they believe is right. Uh, for most major can candidates, major parties, uh, I can understand where they're coming from, even if I personally would not agree with that position. There are exceptions, obviously. Uh, but by and large, I would say that most candidates, I think, are coming from a position that could be viewed as reasonable by a substantial portion of the population. Surely another lesson from science is that if you don't ask the question, you don't get the evidence. <laughs> Not quite. It's, you have to be careful to make a judgment too quickly. Um, and in something like, is this person a nasty person or a nice person, I think that's a quite a complex question. Um, and it's difficult for me to know that about a politician when it's, we're getting very select slices. Um, I can look at the positions, um, and there's going to be positions I agree with and positions I personally disagree with. Um, but you didn't bother? I didn't bother, no. Um, Joe Chancellor, 50-50, what did he bring to the party? So he and I have very similar skill sets in that we both can program, and we both are good at statistics and machine learning. And so we basically divided and conquered the tasks. Um, initially, my job was I ran the app because I wrote the code for the app to collect the data, and he was involved with doing all the modeling. So I, I didn't really do any of the actual machine learning and modeling up until probably the second month of the project. So actually, when, when, when um, Cambridge uh, Analytica or SCL didn't need the psychometric center, did they? No. That's all. I mean, I, I think the, the mistake the psychometric center made in the negotiation is they believed that models are useful rather than data. And it's actually just the opposite. Data is far more valuable than models because if you have the data, it's very easy to build models. Because models, you use just a few well-understood statistical techniques to make them. Um, I was able to go from not doing machine learning to knowing what I need to know in one week. Uh, that's all it took, yeah. if, if you're competent in Because once, once SCL and uh, Cambridge Analytica have got to know that uh, one of your, one of your uh, uh, 
survey uh, uh, people as, uh, as um, uh, like to, uh, let's take an imaginary uh, Facebook page out of the 500, I hate Hillary Clinton, uh, sure. job done, isn't it, really? Uh, not quite. I mean, the, um, in terms of building models, so remember when we built the models, we had all of the Facebook page likes. We gave SEL a very tiny portion of them. So on Facebook, there's over 150 million pages people can like. So what you're referring to is eventually we gave them some page likes. But initially, we, we kept it all and we built models on all of them. There, there isn't some knowledge required and expertise required to understand how to do it correctly. Um, but it's very noisy. We did. And Mr. Chancellor was, um, joined Facebook in 2015. Yes, sir. So um, uh, how, what was, how did you... How did you um, uh, uh, come to uh, work together, and, and, and how did he come to presumably take an offer from Facebook that he couldn't refuse? Um, so he came to me as a postdoc uh, to my lab. So um, my previous postdoc got hired by Facebook, actually, and so we needed to replace him. And so we, create, we were recruiting for a position. We published it uh, publicly, and Joe applied. Uh, my previous postdoc actually had a, a relationship with Joe that had met before, and so he highly recommended Joe. Um, and so he came uh, to work with me that way. And initially it was just in the lab research and then we decided to do the partnership in terms of business. The Facebook side came about because uh, Joe had another baby. So he was already a father and he had a second child and he needed a real income. Um, and obviously startups are very risky. And so he decided to go try to find a tech job. Um, and we had a good relationship with Facebook. We recommended to, uh, Joe to Facebook and he interviewed and it went well. Yeah, and GSR, just the, the, the final question yes, on uh, loose ends. GSR has been wound up. Yes, sir. Um, you didn't take a salary from it? Never. Um, did it cover many of your expenses? It covered a few expenses as far as travel a couple of times, uh, but negligible. And when it was wound up, was there any surplus left to be distributed? Uh, there was. So when we started GSR, we put in 9,000 pounds. When we wound it up, I think it was around 8,000 pounds. But none of the two hundred and thirty thousand pounds was was left in it. I mean, it was just yeah. what, what happened to that? So it was spent first on developers trying to build that brand product that failed. It was spent on buying Twitter data. So uh, before that product, and it was then spent uh, on lawyers um, negotiating with Facebook uh, once they came uh, in the wake of December twenty fifteen. Okay. Um, with regard to your app, which 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 you wrote, uh, one of yes. the neat the neat uh, the way the way it worked, one of the neat tricks was it, it could get into people's networks yes, and sir. get friends. So you pay a, you buy a pay a couple of dollars and you get depending on how many friends they've got a thousand for the price of one almost. Uh, so I think the average was closer to between two to three hundred people. But yes, so, but that was the, that was the smart mathematical trick really in terms of numbers. Yeah, it was the efficient way of gathering data on Facebook at the time. Could you just explain for people that I, I, I play, I, I only use one Facebook app, I play Scrabble, and I spend far too much time playing Scrabble it's a great app. on Facebook. Um, but on my Facebook, I've got a setting that only friends can see my friends. Yes, sir. Um, when I do one, if I were to do one of your surveys, I've not become a friend of yours, have I? So how, do you, how, how does it actually technically work that you go from the survey down to see... All the friends. My friends, presumably sure. if, I'm, if I'm on that setting. Yeah, sure. And not just that only I can see my friends. Yeah, so the, <clears throat> from 2006 to 2015, the Facebook API, um, one of its core features was that you could gather data about the user and the friends. And the, I think the thesis was that the data is highly innocuous and it's basically public if all of your friends can see it. So the information that we could gather through the API about a user's friends was only things that the user can see and the rest of the friends can see. So for example, um, your wall post on Facebook uh, is something anybody can see that is a friend of yours. But your private messages is only something you and the person you're talking to can see. So the first class of data you could share, but the second class you could not because I, that's not information I would have. So um, at that point, as long as A, it was something visible to me as your friend, and B, your security settings permitted me as your friend to share that data, we could collect it. Um, and it wasn't really a trick, it was just, it was a core feature of the system at that time. It was central to what you were doing. It was central to what we were doing, it was central to what a lot of companies were doing. 
Sure. Okay. But I, I, will, I want to come on to terms and conditions in a moment. But yes, uh, sir. You know, when I'm when I'm getting a, a couple of dollars uh, for, a, mm -hmm. for a server, I'm I'm not aware that effectively I'm making you one of my friends, and therefore you can steal my friends. Oh, give uh, a bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, so it's not quite that I'm becoming one of your friends. Uh, you're granting me access to data money. about your friends. Yeah. Um, Which is the, the the same same thing. Ah, uh, I, I think. I'm, on the Facebook platform, there's a distinction. Um, the other thing is you, you would be aware of the data we are gathering. So when you go and say, I want to log in, and it says GSR app would like to collect some of your data, it tells you explicitly the things you want to collect. And Facebook controls this workflow, and it'll say, we want to get your name, your location, your page likes, and we want to get the same information for your friends. So that would be quite front and center in terms of the type of data being collected. Okay, can I, um, just looking at the terms and conditions of, yes, the, of, uh, of GSR and uh, This Is Your Digital Life, your second two apps which we use yes, commercially. Um, there, there is the, uh, there's Magdalen College, which you mentioned before, and St. John's Innovation yes, Centre. Sir. They're both University of Cambridge establishments. Right? Um, so Magdalen College is just where I lived. So the St. John's Innovation Center is a commercial business center. Right. Uh, so we got a mailbox there. So initially when I set up the company, I just registered it literally where I lived, and then we moved to, to, have a, to be at the Innovation Center. Just so once we got our okay. new business partner, so he but, it's, but it's undeniable that Magdalen College is, is, is a Cambridge University. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you have to get some, what sort of approvals did you have to get when you register? Um, from the university when you register companies on their premises? I, I did not get any approval. Oh, does, does Cambridge insist on not that approvals for companies? Not that I'm aware of. So and therefore, if, 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 if uh, no approvals were needed, the, the, presumably then the university was not insisting that, that uh, it, it knows it's quite clear what companies are doing that are registered on its premises. I think that would be an overstatement in my view because just because a company is registered doesn't mean you have a crystal ball into what the company is doing in terms of activity. No, no, um, I'm just, the point I'm making is if, if, if you didn't go through any approval process no. or the university doesn't have one or, or, or if it did, you, I wasn't aware you didn't that. go through it, yeah. then there's no opportunity to ask questions about what the companies are doing and whether, whether the university approves uh, that a company that is doing a certain thing is registered on, on its premises. Uh, yes, sir. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, can I? Uh, I'll just go back to this email before moving on. In terms of the payments, uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, is is there any is there any reason why in this email to you that John Rust, uh, the head of the Cambridge yes, University sir. Psychometrics Centre, would would describe what you were planning as a get rich scheme scheme at, at, at their expense? Paranoia. You got I the mean, wrong end of the stick. Huh? I mean, I, like. Quite frankly, uh, they're not here with me today because of greed. Uh, it's ironic, but uh, John, like as I was uh, describing before, initially uh, Mr. Wiley floated a budget of $2 million. Uh, yeah. That eventually got clawed back, um, and John just didn't believe it got clawed back. Uh, we now know that it did get clawed back because you, you have the, the contract in hand. So uh, essentially the payments um, apart from the 230,000 for, for, for your role in this, was to keep the data? So, uh, the 230,000, that came as a second agreement yeah, yeah, later. No, but, but essentially your reward for, for, for doing this it was to keep the data. At the end oh, yeah, the oh, yes, yes, exactly. My, Which you could then use in, in your academic life or? Correct. That was part of the deal? I mean, that was the deal. I was rewarded with data. Okay. Um, you say in your evidence that you got some, you've had university ethics approvals for all of your academic work. Yes, sir. Did you have university approval for, for that deal? For the commercial activity? Yes. So th there's no real mechanism for a company to go out and seek ethics approval for a commercial deal. I mean, uh, the university o oversight is over academic activities. This fell outside of that. But this, uh, this was a deal with, in, in which you were, you, your award was, was data that might be used in academic work. It, it could be. So the, the process normally with this sort of situation is that if the activity from commercial activity it generates a data set and you want to bring it to the university, then you try to take that data set and you bring it into the university through a data transfer agreement, and we're in the process of doing that afterwards um, and working through some of the issues with the university. Um, but it's, I've never heard of anybody who runs a company 
trying to get ethics approval for a data set whose primary function was really a commercial en enterprise because I mean, our, our primary deliverable here, first and foremost, was the obligation to that to um, secondary purposes come later when you try to bring the work in for the university. Okay, well maybe these are aspects of uh, that the university might want to look at in, in, in the future if it doesn't already. Can I just come to your terms yes, of application? I don't want to, conditions, I don't want to take too much more yes, time. Um, on, uh, on, on the GSR, um, Clause 3, very, very, um, very, um, uh, uh, the purpose of the application, yes, sir. we use this application as part of our research and understanding how people's Facebook data can predict distant aspects of their lives. Your contribution and data will help us better understand the relationship between human psychology and online behavior. Yes, sir. It's not quite um, the real purpose, is it? It's one of the purposes. I mean, the, so looking back, I mean, I think I should have been much more critical of the document. Um, I didn't write it. Uh, it was given to me, but where I failed, I think, is I was not critical enough of reviewing especially that clause. I was assured that this is what we need to do to make it commercial. I think if the, we had... The, the primary purpose was political. I mean, that was one of the purposes. I mean, the, the way I understood at that point is you brought, write these things broadly so you have broad scope uh, to do what you will with the data. Because in, in truth, there was a variety of things that was planned. One of them was political, another was academic, Third became some of the other commercial activities we gave. Um, if we had to do it again, I think I would have insisted to Mr. Wiley that we do add politics as a use case in that document. Well, it wasn't Christopher Wiley's company. It was yours and Mr. Chancellor's, wasn't it? So, and the, and the, the point three on the di This Is Your Digital Life app is pretty much the same. The purpose of the application yes, sir. is... Uh, yes, sir. But it's misleading. So it's, it's a misrepresentation. Of the I think it's broad. I think it's not specific it's enough. broad. Yeah, and it's... it's so you're asking for why didn't we go outline specific use cases? Because I think the politics is a specific use case. I would argue that the politics does fall under there, but it's a specific use case. And I think yeah. we should have. I don't imagine anyone who, uh, who got paid a couple of dollars would, would, would read this. Uh, uh, that's up to them. But, but yes, lower down, in, in, in longer, denser paragraphs, uh, you, you make it clear that in both cases that actually, whatever that primary purpose is, you can sell this data for yes, any sir. purpose whatsoever. <laughs> Yes. So how does, how does that sit in terms of representing what you're doing uh, to people? Uh, in which way, sir? Well, prominently telling the truth, what the real purpose behind this, uh, behind this, uh, Be behind this survey project. was, yeah. I mean, the, I think in terms of speaking the truth, uh, the reality is, as you've pointed out, very few people, if any, read this, just like very few, if any, people read Terms of Service. Um, I think that's a major flaw we have right now, that people just do not read these things. Um, and these things are written this way. Um, look, fundamentally, I made a mistake by not being critical about this and trusting sort of advice of another company. As you pointed out, GSR is my company, and I should have gotten better advice and better guidance on what is and isn't appropriate. But, um, but immediately the data that you were, were able to get from people taking your services was, was, was passed on to uh, uh, SCL elections yes, uh, for a purpose that was not made clear uh, in, the, in, the, in the application in terms of conditions, and actually a purpose that never mentioned politics at all, in fact, was completely misleading, if anyone had bothered to read it. Yeah, so it's, I, and quite frankly, my understanding was this was business as usual, and normal practice for companies to write broad uh, terms of service uh, that didn't provide specific use cases. So let, I'll give you an example. I doubt mm -hmm. in the Facebook's user policy it says users can be advertised for political purposes. Uh, it just has broad language for, to provide for whatever use cases they want. Um, I agree with you that this is, doesn't seem right, and those changes need to be made. Just want to come to your. Uh, I'm winding up now. Your 60 minutes interview uh, yes, um, uh, on the 22nd of uh, yes, uh, April. So, I mean, from the from the text of that, you accept that you both broke Facebook's terms and conditions. So the that was cut in an interesting way. But let me just elaborate a bit. Is, on that, this. is that a, a yes or a no? Did I break the terms of service? Did, did, you, uh, you accept that you broke. I, I do not. You do not. I don't think they have a developer policy that is valid. That's a different answer. But it's, I mean, the, for you to break uh, a policy, it has to exist and really be their policy. The, the reality is Facebook's policy is unlikely to be their policy. 
given it's that not, it's, no, it's, it's what's in black and white do you accept you broke uh, the term conditions of Facebook uh, as, as Lady I do not irrespective of how they enforced or whether or not I just don't believe that's your policy okay that's that's a I mean that's I mean if somebody has a document uh, that isn't their policy you can't break something that isn't really your policy I would agree my actions were inconsistent with the language of this document uh, but that's slightly different than what I think you're asking. You should be a professor of semantics. Uh, Dr. Kogan, is it? Yes. Um, how did you square? Uh, I take it there's a, you, you accept you've broken in black and white Facebook's terms and conditions. Um, I do not, but continue. And, and, uh, and, and how, did, how did you square that with, um, I mean, with, uh, with the way you were operating? You're an academic at Cambridge University. Yes, uh, the company was registered at Magdalen College. Um, did, did Cambridge ever University ever realise that your commercial venture registered at one of their colleges was breaking uh, the terms and conditions of, of Facebook, one of the uh, did, uh, did the university, university was dealing? Um, I suspect not, but uh, I mean... You didn't tell them? That I was breaking terms of service? Yeah, you didn't tell them? No, because I wasn't even aware. Okay. Uh, um, but, but sir, uh, just on this issue, uh, do you use Facebook? I do. When you signed up, did you read the user policy? Um, no. Did you realize there was a user policy? Uh, I didn't, but actually you've set up companies which have got their own terms and yeah. conditions, so presumably you would, you, would, you, would, uh, you would know where you were with Facebook. So, so I'm, just, I'm just working through, through the experience, just I think it's, it's relevant to understand. Um, so let me, let me, let me ask, me, ask, ask the final question. Um, yes, sir. Another loose end, what was the purpose of Philometrics? Telemetrics. So we built basically a company where we have survey software. It's a bit like SurveyMonkey if you've used that. So the idea was to provide easy tools. Now the, the special thing that's a little unusual was we were trying to figure out ways to forecast surveys. Um, what we found through our experiences is that trying to predict you know, Paul Fairley is impossible. That's a waste of time. But there is value to trying to predict people's responses in aggregate. And so uh, Philometrics was built in a way to try to help you, uh, researchers and uh, companies to predict people in aggregate so they could better understand the diversity across people. It was not related to the work you were doing for no. SCL elections. No. Okay, thank you. So, um, just more on the, um, the Facebook relationship. Yes, sir. Um, and I was just reading the comments from Christopher Wiley uh, when he gave evidence. Us. And he said, um, I remember when, I think it was uh, around July 14, um, Kogan was delayed for a couple of days because Facebook had throttled the app so it could not pull as much data. Yes, there was some problem with pulling as much data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that true? I don't think it is. So I've looked through all of my records to try to find any mention of this. Because I, I saw that and I was very surprised. The only time I actually see any mention of a uh, data disruption was Mr. Wiley messages me in late June and says, hey, has the Facebook blackout affected us? And my response is, what blackout? Wasn't even aware of it. Um, and I know reporters have asked Facebook about this issue, and Facebook has told the reporters, this never happened. So as far as you were concerned, it never happened. So there was no moment when you spoke to Facebook engineers? I don't to... know any engineers at Facebook. So there was no, there was no sort of... Um, uh, dialogue between you and the company at no. the time, because as far as you were concerned. So is that an entirely, why would Christopher Wiley invent that story? Uh, Mr. Your... Uh, Mr. Wiley has invented many things. Uh, you will have to ask him why he's done that. Uh, well, what we might do, I just wonder if you'd hazard a guess as to why he might have done it. Uh, I prefer not to speculate on his internal uh, motives yeah, okay, for yeah, his fair, actions. Fair enough. Um, okay. Um, was there ever a moment in, uh, leading up to the sort of eventual divorce between you and Facebook yes. when, uh, when Facebook engineers, who you, who, mm -hmm. who you said you had, uh, begun to wonder, where, at what stage did they start to rumble with you? What stage did they think that you had um, started to breach the terms and conditions? And, Only what, di and what dialogue, yeah. how did the dialogue go? Sure. So, um, back to uh, Mr. Parley's uh, questioning about the terms of service for Facebook as a developer. Um, I believe I became aware that there was a, this inconsistency because, between their documents and what we did in uh, March 2015. Up to that point, I don't believe I was even aware or looked at the developer policy. But at that 
because prior to that point, and I know that seems yeah, shocking yeah, and surprising, yeah. uh, and this is what I was trying to get at before, the experience of a developer on Facebook is very much like the experience of a user on Facebook. When you sign up, there's a small print easy to miss. Uh, when I made my app initially, I was just a, an academic researcher. There's no company involved yet. Um, and then when we commercialized it, right, so we changed the app, um, it was just something I completely missed. Um, I, I didn't have any legal resources, and, and I relied on SEL. I mean, that was my mistake, but the truth is I relied on SEL to provide me this guidance on what was appropriate. So um, by March 2015, though, we had begun to suspect that Mr. Wiley may not be the most reputable person in the world, and that we should question some of the advice what, he gave. What, what triggered that? So why, what, how, how, oh, why did you reach that? So uh, we reached that conclusion because it was clear that he was duplicitous in his arrangement with SEL and also us. So if yeah. you recall, yeah. he entered into this contractual uh, relationship with my company yeah. to exchange data sets. We, we honored the agreement, he did not. Uh, and it became clear as we looked at it that uh, there might be a scheme there. So um, we reached out to an IP lawyer at this point and got some guidance on the issue. Um, and so in March 2015, we realized, hey, there is this inconsistency. Um, now, why I think the, this is still not Facebook's policy is we were advised that Facebook's terms for the users and developers are inconsistent um, and that it's not actually a defensible position for Facebook that that's, this is their policy. But, but, they, must, but yeah. they must have been sort of checking your work, right? So this is the remarkable thing about the, 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 again, the experience of an app developer on Facebook. You can change the name, you can change the description, you can change the terms of service, uh, and you just save changes. Um, there's no obvious review process. Um, we had a terms of service up on the Facebook platform, uh, linked to the Facebook platform, that said we could transfer and sell data for at least a year and a half. Uh, nothing was ever mentioned. Um, and it was only in the wake of the Guardian article that they came knocking. Uh, so so when, when they did come knocking, wouldn't the easiest thing to have been to simply adjust what you were doing so you did comply? Or was that, had that opportunity gone by then? I think the, so there were two things I was trying to accomplish. They were still somebody I considered an ally and a friend. Um, we collaborated with them, uh, and I was very interested in trying to avoid any negative consequences for my students as far as publications, and that was kind of held over me, uh, that we're going to pause all of the, the data sets that aren't even related to the GSR project uh, until this is resolved. So um, I had a strong interest to just comply with them in any way I could, um, and which we did. Um, they, I think their approach was let's ban the app. Um, yeah. I believe they might have even deleted their own records. Um, at least that, that's kind of the impression I've gotten from talking to reporters about it. I understand. So, so, so final question in, on, on this theme. Yeah. Is once this had all happened, yes, sir. Um, what um, measures did Facebook take to check that any material that they considered mm -hmm. that, that you had mm -hmm. and which you shouldn't have? Uh, was deleted? None. None at all? None at all. Right, okay. Uh, That's all, thank you. Do. Dr. Cogan, you mentioned earlier about some of the £230,000 that you mm. earned being spent yeah. on lawyers negotiating with yeah. Facebook. What, what were they negotiating? So, uh, this is a difficult question because I'm under NDA, not to disclose the details of that agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but we were basically trying to protect ourselves um, and negotiating to make sure there was a happy resolution for everybody. So why have you got a non-disclosure agreement with Facebook? Uh, you'll have to ask Facebook. Right, okay. So, sticking with Facebook, yes. um, you also said earlier, I think, that um, when you uh, were doing work with data sets from Facebook in 2013-14, um, there was no requirement given to you when you were given the data sets mm -hmm. in the beginning to delete them, mm -hmm. and you didn't sign any agreement with them when the data was actually handed mm -hmm. over to you. Yeah. So, can you explain the sequence of events from the point when Facebook first contacted you to delete the data that you had, mm -hmm. um, and what happened afterwards? Uh, so I'll speak it just a bit more broadly, uh, because the NDAs, uh, uh, there was a request, as Facebook has already made it publicly known, the data, they asked us to delete the data and certify that we delete the data, and we went through that process where we deleted the data as best as we could, uh, checked everywhere we could, and 
um, and then certified that we had deleted the and you, Can you remember when that was done? So that was done during the first half of 2016. Okay. And did you also delete um, models and algorithms yes, that have been derived from that data? Yes. yes. So absolutely everything was deleted? As best as we could. I mean, the, we're, right now we're doing a review just to make sure we didn't miss anything in terms of well remnants, but we haven't used anything. So what, what could you have missed? So things, um, the things that we could have missed is maybe there was a summary file somewhere such as like here are the, the average across these users about something. Uh, or maybe there was an email I missed that the data set might have been in. But we're, we're trying to figure this out right now, just to make sure. Um, and have you done that at your own initiative or have you done that at the request of Facebook? My own initiative. Right, okay. So what further measures did Facebook take after they asked you to delete the data um, to ensure that you had deleted it? Was there any exchange of correspondence or? Uh, so, I mean, there is nothing, so once we uh, certified, I think the matter was generally closed. Um, but as we talked before, I think it's, it's actually a legitimately difficult thing to achieve because any sort of audit will never catch bad actors. You cannot stop somebody from putting the data on a hard drive and sticking it under their mattress. Um, I think Facebook is aware of this. I yeah. mean, it's a, it's a tech company. Like your, they, company they, your company didn't put the data on the hard drive and stick yeah, it no, under no, a mattress, no. right? Yeah, 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 I mean, like, look, I, this has been a very painful experience because when I entered into all of this, um, Facebook was a close ally um, and I was thinking this would be helpful to my academic career and my relationship with Facebook. It has very clearly done the complete opposite. Um, I had no interest in be becoming an enemy or being antagonized by one of the biggest companies in the world that could, even if it's frivolous, sue me into oblivion. Um, so we, do, we acted entirely as they requested. Right, okay. So just going back to this NDA, I know you say you can't um, talk about the details of it, but was it only you that was required to, serve, to sign an NDA, or were any of your co-directors required? Uh, I can't talk about their grants. Ask Facebook. Uh, and I understand that's frustrating. Because it seems very, very odd to me, I'm drawing on the, one of the questions earlier, that you've been personally attacked. Um, by Facebook and criticised very, you know, very severely, mm -hmm. and yet your co-directors have not, and you are all doing exactly the same work. Um, I think it's odd from a fairness perspective. It's it's honestly just not that odd from a PR perspective. I, I mean, and that's okay. the reality. That so, can you tell us when the NDA was signed? I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I know there's a concept of parliamentary privilege, but yeah. we, we just don't think it extends over to the United States, at least there's an ambiguity. So the NDA was signed in the United States? I cannot talk about the agreement. <laughs> right, okay. I'm, um, I'm sorry, I want to, but yeah. Right. <laughs> so what contact did you have with SCL or Cambridge Analytica um, and others to recover the data that you had passed to them? Um, so as you could imagine, I have no ability to actually enforce anything. Uh, we requested they delete all the data. Right. When um, did you do that? Again, sort of during 2016. Um, they confirmed to me orally that they were, were going to delete the data. Um, but beyond that... Uh, and that was the end of the yeah. dialogue. Yeah, my so understanding, Facebook spoke to them. Mm -hmm. And Facebook likely got... Oh no, they, they did get certification from them. They deleted the data. I think that is public knowledge. Um, but beyond that... I think it's, it's a very difficult to make sure that SEL didn't put the hard drive onto the mattress, so to speak. Okay. And so, can you confirm to us for the record that you don't uh, continue to hold any data or derivatives from your Facebook apps? I can confirm that as far as we know, we did the best we could to delete it, and we're just double checking. I don't want to say that definitely we don't have it until I'm done checking. Okay. Uh, and we're obviously in a tricky spot where I can't delete anything right now, given the nature of the situation. Okay. Yeah, but there's, I could confirm for the record, I have not used anything from this data, uh, and I knowingly did not keep anything uh, from this data uh, following the, the request. Uh, and I'm just making sure we're thorough right now. 100%, yeah. Okay, and finally for the record, how many other companies did you um, sell or give your Facebook yeah. data to? So the data was given to the following entities. It was given to SEL, mm -hmm. um, and the data set that was given to SEL was restricted in the sense that there was very little raw Facebook data. 
the data was given to Yenoya, Chris Wiley's company, and that was more broad because we gave them the raw Facebook data. So that's probably the biggest uh, data set there. Uh, we gave an anonymous version of the data set to the University of Cambridge through a data transfer agreement. Uh, and then we shared a derivative data set with a researcher at the University of Toronto who I was collaborating with. But this data set was based only on the people who had taken the survey, um, not their friends. Uh, and it was all predicted data rather than any sort of raw Facebook data. So it was in the actual uh, profiles. And it was, uh, again, all fully anonymized. Um, I can confirm that we did our absolute best to delete the data set from the University of Cambridge because that was in my lab and I could control that. Um, and I could confirm that uh, the researcher that we gave the data set also deleted it. All right, but not SCL, Anoya, and um, University of Toronto, you can't? No, also the Toronto, I could confirm, I think. Right, yeah. okay. Uh, I'm, I'm well assured that that happened. Uh, the two ones that I'm less confident in are SCL and Anoya. Okay, and when you share that data, um, do you have written agreements with those organisations? when you yes. enter into that yes. arrangement. Absolutely. And do your written agreements contain any clauses relating to the necessity to delete data at the end of project? Um, at the end of projects, no. Uh, th that's just unusual, I'd say. Because typically we keep a data set because there could be further usage for it mm -hmm. uh, in other areas. Yeah, because you were pretty upset that Facebook wanted you to delete the data, didn't you? You wanted to be able to keep it for your PhD. Uh, yes, yes. Um, projects and research. Yes, so, miss. Yeah. So, in future, do you think you would include uh, a deletion clauses for others? in agreements? Yeah, for if you're handing over data to other companies. <laughs> I doubt I'm going to be in this position in the future, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the future, we'd be very careful before we gave data to anybody. Uh, and would have very strong restrictions on how the data is given and limits on scope. Um, I'd have to think about in terms of deletion. Uh, that's just not an issue I have really considered in terms of like time boxing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it'd be very likely it'd be something I would want to include. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cody. Um, could you um, just tell us a little bit about your work with Aggregate IQ as part of your work with SCL? Uh, there's nothing to talk about. I, I never even heard of them up until about a month ago. Okay. Because they were the, the, the project for the Bolton Super PAC, Aggregate mm. IQ, mm. Uh, were working on with SCL as well. Mm. So this is something I know now. Uh, that was not something I was ever aware of. So you, you were the, um, did you ever work with the Ripon tool that Aggregate IQ developed for? So w when you were processing the data that you were gathering mm -hmm. from the surveys, h how, was that being, how was that being used? You said earlier on that you'd, there were tools that had been developed at the University of Cambridge uh, that could have been used to process the data but weren't. Um, I know, we know that Ripon is the tool that was used by SEL, mm. created for them by Aggregate IQ sure. to, to process data. So uh, w were you, um, if you like, loading the data that you were gathering into, no. into Ripon for them no. to use for the uh, um, Bolton Superpack? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know what Ripon does. Uh, I could say what we did, which was we used a piece of software called R, which is just statistical software. We built models, uh, we made predictions, and we saved them into basically Excel files. And there are CSV files, but think of it as Excel files. We would zip this up, password protect it, and send it off to SCL. Uh, and separately, I would provide them the password. What they did with these Excel files, I have no idea. Could, could you who, who, who was kind of like your um, handler at SEL? Who was the person that you interacted with? Yeah, so uh, there was a, a woman named Sabitha who was the project manager who I interacted with mostly. Yeah, yeah indeed, she's the author of uh, the email that I quoted from earlier on, she's the author of. So, yeah. so obviously she's referring directly to conversations you've, uh, she's had with you. But other than that, I mean, obviously Chris Wiley you've discussed, but um, with other members of the team you met with regularly? Uh, so I met a couple of times with a few other folks in their data science team. Uh, again, for the privacy, I prefer not to bring their names up. Um, but there were like a few of the data scientists folks, for sure, because you know, Sabitha is a project, project manager, but um, the other folks are actually handling the data. And so I'd be interacting with them mostly. And did you work with Jess, Jess Sylvester at all? That name just not ring a bell. Okay. I just wonder whether, whether there are people that um, we, now, we now know as aggregate IQ or AIQ, but actually we just might at the time just be considered to be part of SCL. Uh, 
There's nobody I'm aware of from Agrid AIQ that was part of SCL uh, that rings a bell in any way. Like, I think I could account for pretty much everybody interacted with, and they are not in any way involved, as far as I know. And is it, so, I mean, with the SCL members you work with based either in the UK or, or the US? For that? UK. They're all the, UK. All UK. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. almost everybody I interacted with was a former PhD student from Cambridge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just for the record, it'd be quite useful to, if you could explain to us why why was Facebook data so important to the work you were doing? Uh, my work as an academic or my work here as for SEL? Well, uh, both, if they're different. Okay. Sure. So, um, as a social psychologist, I'm interested in understanding people. One big problem we've had in the field is we typically recruit undergraduates in psychology departments and study them and try to understand people. As you can imagine, you know, the undergrad in a psych program is not the most representative human being alive. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty big flaw. The reason we do this is it's expensive to do anything else. Um, so, and the field's been long disillusioned with this, but this is a big problem we have. Um, the interest in social media and big data in general for me was can we overcome this fundamental problem? Can we get to studying people? Facebook was interesting for two reasons. One, it had a relatively open API, so you could get a lot of data on a lot of people. And two, the Facebook uh, user base is very representative. I think in the United States, it's 70 or 80 percent of the adult population. Uh, there's very few other data sets that are this representative of people. So that's why I was personally interested in, from an academic angle, of trying to solve this problem. For SCL, I think the interest in Facebook was that the, they could gather, again, a lot of data because it's a pretty open API. Um, beyond that, there's no real reason it has to be Facebook. Um, and if I could just add a bit more, because like, I, I think a little bit more context it matters. So we already talked about how they were interested in acquiring the My Personality Project. Another thing that was happening at the same time was they were thinking of going out and measuring personality through phone surveys. Uh, the plan, I believe, was to call people up and ask them 10 items to measure their personality, which is just very, very noisy. So this was an alternative where you could use online methods, but you could still get a pretty big sample. Um, and you balance out sort of the, the random, randomness you could do with phones, but you have a much longer survey. Um, but do you, do you believe, I mean, there have been a number of pieces of academic research conducted looking at the uh, predictive qualities of Facebook data. Do you believe it is superior to... Uh, are they commonly available data sets? Uh, so a lot of the uh, ideas of the accuracy is just grossly overstated. Uh, can I walk you through this? Because I think yeah. it's such an important point. Uh, I prepared some slides for you. Um, it might be unusual to do a stats lecture, but, um, but it's short. Um, well, I think given that we've, we've probably slightly, we may not have time to that now, I think we've got, we could accept the slides you've given us as a written submission to the committee, if that's sure. okay. So let me just high level for you. If, imagine you were trying to predict people's age. And if you did a, in America, it's a great place. Because uh, we know the numbers in terms of the average is 41 and we have the spread. If you did a random guess, you'd be off by about 27 years. So that's pretty bad. If you guessed everybody in America is 41 years old, you'd be off by about 19 years. If you used Facebook data and you had the same accuracy that we had for our personality data, you'd be off by 18 years. But the problem would be, it would tell you that most people are middle age. And when you correct for this, you would get to a situation where you think most people are, are you, you'd be wrong by about 22 years. Uh, the idea that this data is accurate, I would say, is scientifically ridiculous. Um, and the idea that even if you have a lot more data, you can make it super accurate, is also pretty silly. Once you work through, even if you had very high correlations, what it means for actual accuracy. The, the project, quite frankly, if the goal is micro-targeting using Facebook ads, makes no sense. Like, it's not what you would do. Um, if you want to do a project where you micro-target people using Facebook ads, you use the Facebook ad platform, where you could target 100% of the population rather than 15% of the population. We haven't talked about numbers, but we gave SCL 30 million people. And so, why would you want to target only 15% of the population and use only their page likes to do it when you could target everybody using much more information? And you just don't need this data to do that. The Facebook platform gives you every ability to do that, even if you're interested in psychographics. 
So your view, you could just you could just uh, micro target through Facebook as a platform right now, than, rather than developing your own database. Yeah. So I know if you will allow me to explain mm -hmm. how. So the the proper way to do this project, if you wanted to do it right now, if you wanted to say, I want to target people with ads related to personality, right? Like, I, I want to target the real extroverted people. All you do is you go recruit 10,000 people. You don't collect any Facebook data at all. You ask them for their email addresses, and you ask them to fill out a personality survey, 10,000 people. Then you say, what are the 2,000 that are the most extroverted? And then you take their email addresses, and you go on the Facebook app platform, and you say, Facebook, please build me a lookalike audience. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna take those 2,000 email addresses, they're going to find the people on Facebook that match those 2,000 email addresses, and they're going to then use all the data they've got, or a lot of the data they have, to build, to figure out who are all the people like this. And this way you will find everybody who's an extrovert, potentially, based on the, on the predictions. And you would use a lot more of the Facebook data rather than the page likes. Uh, the fact that they, my understanding is they try to run page, uh, Facebook uh, ads from this, this project is just a waste of time. Um, and a colossal waste of money for them from that perspective. But isn't the, isn't the point, it's the linking of someone's Facebook data to uh, other personality indicators as well. And then the ability to go back to Facebook and say, I've, no got, I've, got, a, I've got a group of people who took over this last week, um, mm -hmm. people saying that actually once you've got your, your working data set of, yeah. uh, of individuals, you can then use Facebook tools to identify more people who are likely to be from that set. You don't even need to do that. Because like you said, just get their email address for 2,000 people and get who are the real extroverts. Because the problem is, the predictions we need about personality are incredibly inaccurate, really, really noisy. So if you try to take these highly noisy predictions and select who are the extroverts, you're gonna select a lot of people who are not extroverts. So when you go back to Facebook and say, hey, please build me you know, a look-like audience on this really, really noisy group, it's gonna give you a really, really noisy group. It just doesn't make sense. So in that case, what was the value of the project you were doing for SEL? Given what we know now, nothing. Literally you, nothing. You, a bit of a, you know, you, you, they, they, they hired you as an expert, um, uh -huh. and you designed a survey that you say mm -hmm. is, is worthless. Is that, is that correct? So, and it, it, it's all about the use case, right? So, I was very surprised to learn that all, what they wanted to do was run Facebook ads. Like, this was not mentioned back then. They just wanted a way to measure personality for many people. But if the use case you have is Facebook ads, it's just incompetent to do it this way. I mean, there's no way about it. Because your view is you just do it directly with, through Facebook. Yeah, I mean, there's, you're, with taking this data set, you're going to be able to target 15% of the population and use a, a very small segment of the Facebook data, which are page likes, to try to build personality models. Well, why do this when you could very easily go target 100% and use much more of the data? It just doesn't make sense. But, so I was interested in how you sold this to them. I mean, we, 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 do you look back on your work then and say you were you were mistaken uh, in your the value you placed on this type of, this type of work? Yeah. So uh, the idea that I sold them is a, it's a strong statement. They were already really interested in personality, and I told you they were going to go and call up people, try to measure their personality through this phone survey. So what we gave them was an alternative to tackle this problem. Now what they did with it is the surprise, because if they turned around and then tried to just run Facebook ads on the back of this. This is where the incompetence comes in. But that's not something they told me. Uh, and quite frankly, I didn't run Facebook ads back then. I was not an expert on how the ad platform works. Now I know much more. I've had more experience with it. So I might have missed that. But I would hope if this is their plan, somebody there goes and actually looks at how to run Facebook ads and they would figure this out. Um, but whose who's idea was it to have the Facebook, uh, to have people give their Facebook data as part of completing the survey? So that was myself and the two Sacramentrics members. So why, why did you recommend that? So it was just an alternative to going out and phoning people up. Because it was a more, so the phoning people up idea is pretty difficult because you're asking very few questions to measure a complex thing. So this is a more efficient way to do it online. Yeah, but obviously there was a, there was a, a lot more benefit to it than just identifying people, wasn't there? Or just reaching them through, a, through an, e, an easy mechanism like Facebook because you knew for a while that it, by doing it in this way, you would gather a lot more data. Yeah, yeah, so it's exactly that. It was a more efficient way of gathering a big data set. Yeah, because you were gathering the data set not just the people that took the survey, but all exactly. my friends as well. Exactly. And you're saying that, and, and you're saying that there was no particular value to that. If the goal is to, for you to run Facebook ads, the friend's data is useless. Okay, so f what is the value of it then? For, oh, uh, this data set? I think it's actually in this aggregate form, 
Or, so I'll give you an example of what I was doing with it. After we did the, the data set, we were working on questions like, are people who are kinder happier? And we found it really depends. In states like New York, kinder people are less happy on average. In states like Utah, people who are kinder tend to be happier. And then if you look at the friends information, we predict people's kindness from the friends, you find that it's about your social network, that folks who are kinder and are surrounded by kinder people tend to be happier. But if you're surrounded by not kind people, it's worse. It's questions like this that have nothing to do with running ads are very basic science questions about human nature. Before you said at the beginning, couldn't you just have, you know, given you were getting aggregated data on Facebook anyway, what, what was the point of creating a tool to, to, to create your own aggregate you data can't, set? You can't do this because the, to do this, you're looking at the relationship at the individual level. You need people to know like, hey, this is 10,000 people in New York and here's their um, happiness and here's their kindness score. So you need individual level data to do this. Okay. Well, I mean, you've given your view on it. I think there are, there are others that would um, maybe ascribe more value to the data that you were gathering and the importance of gathering it in the way that you were. But, I mean, you stated uh, your position on that. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about, yes, um, about Mark Zuckerberg's statement. Uh, yes, his, initial, his initial statement on his Facebook page on the 21st of March. Um, he, he sort of, in a typically carefully worded statement, walks us through uh, the chronology of the events of your work as he saw it. Um, and I just wanted to ask about that. So he says that, in, obviously in 2014, they made changes to the way the platform works to prevent abusive apps, as he called it. But actually, um, although by, if by abusive apps he means apps that gather Facebook friends data, that was completely within the terms of conditions of the site at the time. So exactly. I don't know how he describes that as being abusive, given that that was within... I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he also, we also, as a result of the change, that we also required developers to get approval from us before they re could request any sensitive data from people. So presumably that means before 2014, you didn't need their approval to gather sensitive data about Facebook users. Yeah, you just say, this is what I want, and they give it to you. Yeah. Um, he said it, it's against uh, policies for developers to share data without people's mm -hmm. consent. But you, you disputed that earlier on. You, don't, you, you, you seem to believe... Did you believe that because you had your own terms and conditions for your, uh, for your app that you therefore you had asked their consent? Is that yeah. your view? So that was certainly my feeling at the time, or my understanding at the time. Uh, I would have a different view now, uh, but at the time that was my perspective. Do you want to say, when Facebook brought these changes in in 2014, yes, sir. did you believe that apps that had been developed and launched mm -hmm. before those changes could still work to the old rules? I mean, that was a fact. So yeah. we were, so old apps were given a year to continue to operate under their old rules. Because uh, they basically said there's now two versions of the API, the, the API, the original and the new version. Uh, he's talking about the new version. The old version, which would be running for another year, was allowed to operate as before. So your apps were incredibly valuable, weren't they, for people that wanted to gather Facebook data at that time because they could still enjoy the, the grandfathered rights of the old, old uh, yes. APIs rather than the new ones. Yes, sir. And did people speak to you about that? I mean, was there more? Did, did, you, did you speak to other organisations about trying to make the most of the, the tools you'd developed before uh, that time ran out? Uh, it was literally only the SEL project that we ever did with anybody, well, in terms of the commercial uh, activities. Okay. We didn't talk to anybody else afterwards to collect more data. It was just that was it. Yeah. Okay. I think it's um, I think it's a fun sort of set of questions we have now. Just ask about some of your other work. Yeah. Uh, as well. Um, whilst you're at University of Cambridge, you also worked at the University of St. Petersburg, didn't you? Uh, yes, I had a loose affiliation there. What was the what, what, time, what, what time period were you yeah. were, were you doing that work? Yeah, so in uh, I believe summer of 2013, a couple of my friends wanted to visit the uh, the St. Petersburg. So I went along because Russia is actually a pretty hard place to go without a Russian speaker, and I could more or less speak Russian. Um, so while there, I visited the university to say hi, uh, kind of, and it's kind of a typical thing I would do in most places I visit. Um, so after that. Uh, they said, like, okay, let's set up some kind of collaboration. So then uh, they invited me out to do some talks, I think a year later. At some point, some of the researchers there applied for a grant from the university. Um, and I believe they put my name on it. They thought it would help. And, I, and they got it. Uh, I didn't read this grant. I didn't write this grant. I can't write in Russian. I could barely read in Russian, very slowly. Um, so they got that grant. Uh, I was invited out to do a couple more talks. I did a workshop on statistics, okay, yeah, uh, that was it. I think 
We had maybe one or two meetings where I gave them a bit of an advice about the project. Um, I never was part of the data collection, never part of, I never had access to the data in any way. So what, what was the, what was the, um, you described some of the work that was done. Mm -hmm. What was the, um, what was the, the thesis that you were, you were working on? What was the subject matter? So, and I won't say me, because it's really them. I don't want to take credit for somebody else's work. Um, but I believe what they were tackling was how do we curb cyberbullying? Yeah. How do we stop people from being mean to each other online? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what, and when was this work being done? What was the... I want to say it was between 2014 and 2016. Okay. And that's right. I would have to double check. <laughs> so, so sort of following on, really, from the work you were doing with SEL? Uh, to an extent, yes. Overlapping a little bit. Although, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And did you, did you uh, was Cambridge University aware of the work you were doing? Of course. Uh, at yeah. St. Peter's Before I accepted any position, I went to my department head in the university to make sure everything was fine. Are there any requirements to notify other authorities that you're conducting research work in Russia? So you didn't, you didn't, certainly didn't. So you just, um, you only informed the university, the university itself. Yeah. yeah. Did you engage? Who else in Russia outside the university was aware of the work you were doing? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I only interacted with like three or four researchers there. Beyond that, I have no idea. Yeah. Does, is it? I mean, obviously, there, Russia has been subject of our investigation as well, uh, and. Uh, there continue to be questions around that. Is it possible at all, because maybe if you travelled with a with laptop that contained data and information, the people in Russia could have gained access to, no. benefited from work you were doing for SEL? You don't travel <laughs> with this data set in your laptop. This is too much data. I lived in a server in Portland. Okay. Uh, if I, yeah, I mean, like, it just doesn't make sense. And there's no way for that to be remotely accessed. So. I mean, if somebody wants to hack Amazon, uh, go for it. But then, like, just hack Facebook. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's mostly a ridiculous idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Paul Ferry. Uh, just uh, yes, um, your your accent's American, so uh, um, then yeah. we've got uh, we've got Russia coming up. So, um, you, you moved to the states as a as a child. As a seven-year-old. Seven-year-old. Yeah. Okay. From. Uh, so I was born in Moldova, and then the place I'm still trying to get to. <laughs> Some great wine. I haven't been in a long time. Uh, I actually don't know much about it. So yeah, we immigrated when I was seven years old from, uh, I believe, Moldova, actually. We what, spent did you, what did you, just curious, what your mother and father do? So my father was a programmer, and my mother is a seamstress slash fashion designer. Uh, I mean, my mo the motives for a move was, A, the country had just fallen apart, and B, we were getting death threats on account of my father being Jewish. So we're either going to move to Israel or we're going to move to uh, the United States, and I believe we went through as Jewish refugees. Um, if my recollection is correct, one of the Jewish programs in the United States sponsored our plane tickets. So, um, and uh, is your work at St. Petersburg now, now finished? Uh, as far as I know. Uh, uh, St. Petersburg comes up, it's... Uh, yeah. The, the, you have to switch the alarm bells off because, because it's just pure coincidence. It's just pure coincidence. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. Do you know whether or not any GSR data was used by the Vote Leave campaign in um, the referendum? So I don't know, but I don't know why they would, because we only gave them data for people who reported the location in the United States. Right. Okay. And your team um, is non-US, isn't it? Uh, what do you mean by non-US? Well, are, are, they, are they all based in the United States, your team? My, the GSR team? Yeah. No, we were in Cambridge. You're over here, but yeah. you're processing US oh. election data, aren't you? So we're processing Facebook data, um, and we, yeah, so I think, yeah, we pro pro process so Facebook data. So outside the jurisdiction of the U.S., so U.S. citizens' data being processed outside of the U.S. Ah, uh, so this bit is a little tricky, because mm -hmm. the servers where they were set up were in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. So the, you just keep in mind that, like, there's now cloud, right? So we set, the database was in Portland, Oregon. Um, we collected the data through the service in Portland, Oregon. Um, the modeling, I'm not exactly sure where it was done, either here or there. So it's the, your company doing the modeling, but yes. you don't know where it was done. So it's either here or, or the U, US. Uh, it's entirely possible it was here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it'd be probably safer. I think we, when we delivered the files, especially the second version, we gave it a physical hard drive to SEL. So, so do you accept that if it was, it's processed here, it's processed outside the US jurisdiction, so US citizens election data processed outside. So uh, the, the only thing is like just the elections bit. Data is certainly being processed outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just 
I'm not sure I would characterize it as elections data because um, there's no election results or anything like that. I just don't know the technical definition of election well, okay, data. political. Uh, but even there, like I, I, I don't, I fear that's a technical term in terms of how it's defined, uh, and I'm, and I want to commit to like legal language that means a specific thing when we're speaking locally. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'll have one more try on the NDA, which is was yeah. it was it signed pre or post the data breach in 2015? What do, what do you mean by data the breach? The Facebook data breach. What do you uh, so the. Facebook users' data being passed and used through GSR, SCL, Cambridge Analytica? I cannot answer that question. I thought that might be the answer. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, like, try. <laughs> but you could piece together the timeline, I think. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Um, just a few more questions, yeah. uh, Dr. Kogan. Uh, just, to, just to cover it off for the record, the, the work that was done through the University of St. Petersburg, who funded that work? Uh, the university. The university itself? Itself. Was that from a particular, often universities apply to particular grant pots at particular institutions? Can you elaborate a little bit more about where that money came from from within the university? So, I honestly don't know. What I've read is that the Russian government gave the, just sort of a block grant to the university and then they divvy it up, uh, but just pretty normal practice, obviously, in every country. Yeah, but, but, they would, but would, so if the Russian government had given the funding to the university, normally it's with uh, the view of commissioning certain types of work, work, work in the subject yeah. that it, it, it has an interest in yeah. academic so work. In the UK, on. that's how it works. In the US, that's how it works. I think in Russia, it's actually much more generic, where it's a big block grant, and then the university is responsible for actually commissioning specific projects. So I think that's actually a, a distinction between the two. But if, but if the, this work was about cyber, if it's, you know, a, piece of work on cyber bullying being, yeah. being funded by the Russian government um, might make you wonder what their particular interest in that was. Um, <laughs> it's like most work that's funded by so the How UK, to do it rather than how to stop it might be. I mean, about. like that. I mean, you can make the same argument about the UK government funding anything, right? And the US government funding anything. I mean, like, both countries are very famous for their spies. So, and yeah, so, like, I think that that's a big leap. Well, I just, I, obviously, there's a lot of work done analysing the interference of Russian agencies yeah. in in foreign elections and the creation of networks of bot accounts and yeah. trolls to you know intimidate people. Of course, and um, I mean, there's there's a long history of the United States interfering with foreign elections and doing the exact same thing. So, I mean, unless you want to argue that. Well, no. What's saying? Are you saying it's are you saying it's equivalent? Are you saying that the, the the work of the Russian government is equivalent to the work of the United States government, and you couldn't really distinguish between the two? Is that your opinion? Uh, in in general, I would say. Most, or sort of the, the, the government's the most high profile. Uh, I am dubious about the moral scruples of their activities through the long history of the UK, the United States, and Russia. Trying to equate them, I think, is a bit of a silly uh, process, but I think certainly uh, all these countries have engaged in activities that people feel uncomfortable with, are covert. Um, and then to try to link academic work that is basic science to that, if you're going to go down the Russia line, I think we have to go down the UK line and the US line in the same way. Um, I just don't see, and I understand like Russia is a hot button topic right now, but outside of that, I mean like, look, most people in Russia are like most people in the United Kingdom. They're not involved in spycraft, they're just living lives. Yeah, but I, I just, I'm, not, I'm not aware of uh, UK government agencies that have been interfering in uh, um, foreign elections, but. Uh doesn't it mean it's not happening. <laughs> Could be just better at it, isn't that well? Uh, what, 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 were the, what were the sort of aspects of cyberbullying that it covered? I, I, the again, I, 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 I truly don't know. I like the exact details of that project. Um, I don't know the final results, uh, the methodology I loosely understand or remember. Um, but just keep in mind, like, I was a name on a grant rather than an active participant and collaborator in this. What, um, how long did um, Dr. Michael Kaczynski work with you at GSR? I'm sorry? My, Dr. Michael Kaczynski, how long, how long was he working with you at, G, at GSR? He, he never worked at GSR. He never did at all? No. And have you worked with him on any other projects? So we were collaborating for a while, I'd say in 2013, on academic work. Um, I don't think it ever went anywhere. Um, he was going to be part of this SEL project, as we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that ended up not, hap not happening. Exactly. Well, could you say what were the nature of the academic projects you collaborated on? Uh, Facebook data. Facebook data trying, and working on various angles there. Uh, so my lab had access to the My Personality data set that Dr. Kaczynski and Dr. Silva ran. So we're thinking of a variety of different project ideas. 
Uh, I just I don't think we ever learned anything that was effective. Yeah, I'm sure you know that he he posted on his Facebook page that he visited the Russian Prime Minister to brief him on some of the work being done by the Psychometric Center in at Cambridge. Were you aware of that? I was not. Okay, so um, and you don't know what 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 particular projects he discussed, what work he discussed in that, that meeting? No idea. I presume he could.